Uh, good morning. My name is Jeff Squires. I'm from Cisco, and I'm going to be talking about the OpenMPTI overview and architecture. First, in a bunch of talks that we're going to give this week that we'll put up on the website, and uh, hopefully, a bunch of people will benefit from seeing some of the internals of OpenMPI. Uh, first thing I want to do is give a, a big thanks to Greenplum. Greenplum is hosting us this week and providing all the filming services and things like that. Um, there's some Greenplum people in the audience that you can't see on the camera, but thank you very much, Greenplum, for setting all this up for us. Um, now, I do want to say uh, the, the purpose of this, it's not an uh, exact reference for OpenMPI. This is a general overview. I'm going to talk about some details. Uh, but I'm not going to go into arbitrary depth. There's only so much you can do in the time that we have allotted. Uh, this particular talk is going to be two hours. We might very well split it up a little bit more on the web. But uh, <laughs> if we go into arbitrarily deep on the internals of OpenMPI, we could be here for at least a week. Um, so this is an overview. You need to go take this and use this as a starting point to go look at the code, right? Go do some exploring, go read some code, go try some things, go break some things see what works and see what doesn't. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's give an overview of my talk here. Now, not everybody here is from the HPC and MPI background, so I'm going to give a real brief background of uh, overview of OpenMPI, uh, of MPI and OpenMPI. Then I'm going to go, uh, then we'll launch into the full-on OpenMPI stuff here. So uh, I'll talk about our version numbering scheme, which is kind of important if you're going to be dealing with the OpenMPI community we talk about our different branches and our different version numbers, and so it's just good to understand that nomenclature. Then I'll talk about building and installing OpenMPI itself. Um, it's uh, anywhere from very simple to very complex, depending on what your goals are. Um, there's a lot to it, but most of it can be avoided in some situations, and some of it can't be in other situations, so I'll talk about that. Um, then I'll talk about our code architecture, the way our tree is laid out, some of the similarities that exist in different parts of the tree, where you can build, where you need to stay away from, things like that. And then we have a whole concept of what are called runtime parameters in OpenMPI. Now we'll talk about them as well. And then uh, dive into just a few details, not very deep at all, but some of the more common code that you'll see all throughout uh, the OpenMPI code base so that you can at least just say, oh yes, I've seen that, and you'll know where to go look and read up about it and stuff like that. And finally, I'm going to highlight um, something that started off as a sub-project in OpenMPI, and actually still is a sub-project in OpenMPI, but it's actually becoming more and more important in the OpenMPI code base uh, itself, something called hardware locality, or you can pronounce it a lot of different ways. I pronounce it HWLOC. So let's talk about MPI goals itself, and this is really... Uh, MPI itself as a standard. OpenMPI is one implementation of that standard, but let's talk about MPI itself. So it's a high-level network API, right? It is supposed to abstract away the underlying network and make it easier for non-computer scientists and non-programmers to write parallel and distributed computing types of things. Um, it's meant to be that simple things are simple. You can just say MPI send and give it a one gigabyte message, and a miracle occurs, and it gets over to the other side. Okay? Uh, it's also designed to be very friendly to high-performance computing networks. So it's not like the Sockets API, which is, has some inherent unoptimal things in there, shall we say. Uh, MPI was designed to be that it could be very close to the hardware itself, so that there's a very short distance between the top-level API and the underlying hardware itself. Now, in this field, uh, in, in high performance computing, when I say high performance, I'm really talking about nanoseconds. So we typically measure latencies in terms of microseconds and or hundreds of nanoseconds. So this is very different than typical enterprise computing where you typically think of, oh, 50 microseconds, that's pretty fast. That's really slow to us in the high performance computing arena. Uh, one microsecond, two microsecond, half round trip latencies, these are what we consider to be the normal in the HPC and MPI arenas. Um, and uh, paired with that, of course, too, is a rapid ascent to maximum bandwidth for large messages. Right? So when we talk about latency, we're talking about short messages. When we're talking about bandwidth, we're talking about large messages. But you want uh, to get up to maximum bandwidth as fast as possible with your, your message size. Now, as I mentioned a couple times, MPI is typically used in high-performance computing scenarios. So when you have uh, such a big compute job that it just doesn't fit on one server. So you need to spread it out across 
tens, hundreds, or even thousands of servers altogether, and possibly using hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of, of compute cores. So you'll see a bias for this kind of environment in the MPI arena. So in the MPI API itself, and in a lot of the things that I talk about, it, it's kind of biased towards HPC computing. Um, but the thing is, is that HPC as a term, its definition is changing uh, because people like Greenpalm and Cisco and others kind of recognize just a good network IPC API. And there's no need to reinvent it for other fields. There's a lot about MPI that can be used outside of an HPC arena. And that's where some of these other companies are starting to look at these things. So that's just a, a, to kind of level set us to the whole thing there that MPI is typically used for HPC, but it's starting to break out of that niche a little bit and other people are starting to explore it. And that's really all I'm gonna say about that. Um, so that's enough of a background there to level set us. Let's go into the guts of OpenMPI, which is after all why we're here. Let's talk about our version numbering scheme. OpenMPI's version numbering scheme has three numbers, very much like uh, most software projects. We have major, minor, and release numbers. Um, but what's a little different, and it's kind of common in the open source world, we have two concurrent release series. So if the minor number is odd, we call that our feature series. And if the minor number is even, we call that our stable series. And we encourage our production and enterprise customers to use the, the stable series. Um, and we leave them there, and sometimes it, it, it goes for a while while we're developing the next series, the feature series, and so on. And when that guy becomes stable enough, we transition that guy to become the next stable series, and so on. Now, both series are actually very well tested. They're very well QA'd, and so on. The main difference between the two is that the stable series has just been out in the real world longer. And it has just been exposed to more real world codes, and we've shaken out more bugs, and more corner cases have gotten fixed and all these kinds of things. So, so really, you know, we, we give the same amount of testing to both of them, but the stable series just, again, has that more real world time logged against it. Now, uh, we use subversion for our main upstream development. And so uh, we use the subversion terms for describing things. So our trunk is where we do active development. So the subversion trunk, and that is mostly stable. <laughs> Sometimes people break things, uh, but for the most part, you can pick up a trunk revision and be able to, to do things. And again, developer mostly stable. It is not something that we would put out as a real release into the real world. But as a developer, you should be okay getting out of trunk revision and, and going. Now on the, the feature series, um, the scope of what we do there is that we add and remove new features. Um, I would say, I don't want to say we break things, but we're more adventurous on the feature series than we are on the stable series. So we're more inclined to take risks. Um, on the stable series, we do not do any new features at all. We only do bug fixes, and the, the goal there is stability, 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 and then perhaps a little more stability on top of that. So the stable series, stability, feature series is where we do our exploration, um, pushing new things, trying new things, and so on. Let me show you what it looks like. So if this is the subversion trunk, and time is going downwards in this picture here, uh, periodically we will branch off for a new feature series, right? And then again, normal subversion nomenclature here, subversion branch. And periodically, once, once we get that feature branch to a stable enough point, we will start doing feature series releases. So for example, 1.5, 1.5.1, 1.5.2, and so on. And notice that minor number is odd, so it's a feature series. Now, after a while, we will transition this to a stable series, meaning that we will change that minor number to be even. So we don't rebranch, and this is a little different. We don't rebranch, we basically just rename because it's gotten basically a lot of bugs worked out. People have tried it out in the real world. We finished adding all the features that we wanted to add to it and so on, and we just rename it to be 1.even, in this case 1.6, 1.6.1, and, and so on. Now, another key aspect here is that from here on down, the entire branch will be ABI stable. So if you compile your MPI code against 1.5.1, you can also just run it against 1.6.1 or 1.6.x or, or anything. Um, this is something that users told us that they wanted, and so it's an important feature that, uh, that we carry forward. Now, just to carry this a little uh, farther, you'll see that you know, eventually, 
uh, off the trunk will then branch again someday for the 1.7 and eventually 1.8 branch. And this guy will be ABI stable as well. And the trunk gets labeled to be 1.9 at that point. So someday we will be, you know, branch off for 1.9. And we're actually going to call 1.9 and 2.0. But that's a different topic. Again, we are hosted by Subversion, and Indiana University graciously provides all the hosting services for us. So another shout out here. Thank you very much for Indiana University. This URL will be in the notes, um, and I think if you're involved with the OpenMPI community at all, you know what this URL is, but this is our main upstream Subversion, and our bug tracking system is there as well. Now, that being said, uh, a lot of us OpenMPI developers use other uh, development system. So Subversion is great, uh, but there are ones that people tend to prefer more without going into that whole religious debate there. Um, that's cool. My Mac is yelling at me. Hold on. It's telling me I have to give a talk at Green Plum right now. Um, a lot of OpenMPI developers like to use Mercurial or Git. I'm kind of a Mercurial guy myself. And so we have found, um, I would say, a good, at least 75% of OpenMPI development happens in Mercurial or Git, and then eventually makes it back up in, into Subversion. So I just wanted to give a, a quick overview of how we do that. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. This is one way to do it, and this is the way that we typically do it. Um, it's really great for internal development. So we have a, a Cisco internal Mercurial branch that all of us work on, and then I'm the guy who does the, the commits up to Subversion. But basically, the general scheme is that you know, we have the, the main OpenMPI Subversion repository, and then you do a subversion checkout, but you also make it a, a Mercurial repository, or Git. When I say Mercurial, the, the same exact concepts apply to Git here as well. And then from there, you can just do all the clones that you want to do, uh, kind of thing. Let me give that in a little more detail. And when I say a little more detail, I mean commands, because we're all developers here. Um, and and uh, I think we'll all know what this means. If you're a Mercurial or a Git person, this will probably make sense for you. So first, you do a normal subversion checkout, and then you CD into that directory. Then in that directory, you make it a Mercurial repository. You just run hg init. Then we have a built-in .hg ignore file that you can copy from one of our subdirectories. It's contrib hg .hg ignore. Copy that up to the top level directory and then run hg add. This will add everything that you just checked out into the Mercurial repository. Then we have another Perl script which actually goes through and looks at all the SVN ignore properties and builds a proper hg ignore file. Um, so this is just kind of a starter one that makes it ignore the .svn directory. This one here will actually build up everything from all the svn ignore properties. The last one here then, we just commit that and we say, oh, okay, as of svn r, you know, whatever, this was the first commit that we did in the Mercurial repository. Then you can cd dot dot out of there and then clone to your, your heart's content from there. Right, so we cloned our combo repository into my work clone. All right, now this is kind of important. You don't really want to do any work in that combo repository. You want to do all your work in the clones themselves. Let me show you what that looks like. So one of the key aspects of this scheme is that we like to stay in sync with the subversion trunk. I mean, it's kind of all good if you like Mercurial and Git and whatnot, but it's useless if you can't stay in sync with subversion, right? I mean, that's the whole point of this. So let's look what it would look like here to pull down new subversion commits into your clones. So if you go into that combo repository, again, this guy right here, right? Um, you run a Mercurial up to, to, to uh, get any of the changes that you've made. Then you run subversion up, just like you would normally do in a subversion tree, SVN up. Now, you might have to merge and resolve some conflicts uh, if anything comes up there. So somebody did something up in the trunk that conflicts with what you've done in Mercurial. You might need to resolve some things there. Um, then rebuild the hg ignore file. Then do hg add remove. hg add remove is it will add all new files that it sees and remove any files that have disappeared. So if somebody deleted something off the subversion trunk, that will automatically do an hg remove. Quite handy. Then just commit. And then you go into your clone and you just do a pull from there. So you see basically we did SVN up to pull the stuff down here. We commit it and then we do an hg pull to pull it down into your clone from there. Then to go the other direction, it's pretty much the same thing. So if you're in your clone and you did a bunch of work and you committed it and then you push it, you push it up to the combo repository, 
and then you change into the combo repository. You do an HG up to bring those changes into that directory. And then you, you might, again, have to merge and resolve any conflicts and things like that. And then you SVN commit. Right? So basically, this guy here in the middle, he functions as the, the switch place between your two. Right? So you do your work down here. You push up here. You HG up. And then you SVN commit. And it goes up to a subversion. All right? Now again, there's at least five different ways to do this kind of stuff. This is the way that works for us. Hopefully, this is useful to you. All right, again, I want to emphasize this here. The combo is really only for pushing and pulling and committing and updating and things like that. Don't do any work in the combo because it gets very hard to track which files are new, which files are going in which direction, and so on. So this guy's really only for the switch one. We have a, a very detailed wiki page about how to do this. Again, we'll have the link on this on the web page so you can easily click through. But if you go to the OpenMPI wiki, just look for the page with Mercurial on it. All right, so with that little aside, let's dive into even more meat here about building and installing OpenMPI itself. Distribution tarballs are very easy to build. Um, they're very much like many other open source packages. Um, so you can just configure. Typically, you want to give it a prefix, like somewhere under your home directory or something like that, and then just make install. Now, a side note on this, um, we've seen this every once in a while, a new developer would get confused by this. When you're building OpenMPI, uh, the machine that you're working on must be time synchronized with the file server. So if you're building on a local machine, this is a, a non-issue because you're, you're building on a local machine and the time is synchronized. But if you're building on a network file system and you are not the network file server, make sure that your machine is time synchronized uh, with the file server. Because if you don't, you will see all kinds of strange behavior. Things will fail, things will reconfigure, bad things will happen. Just make sure that you're using NTP or some other time synchronization machine or mechanism to synchronize the client with the file server. Now, another question that a lot of new developers ask is, where should I install? OpenMPI, just to be totally clear, OpenMPI is not designed to be used from the build directory. So where you invoke make, don't try to invoke uh, OpenMPI from in there. You really need to install it and use it from the install tree. So then the question comes up, where do I install it? Well, developers, as developers, I typically install under my home. I just have a directory where I, I typically install it to. Uh, I don't need root permissions. Uh, OpenMPI doesn't need root permissions for anything. So you, if you just give it a prefix of somewhere underneath your home, it's very easy that way. Now, I, I typically also install on a network file system so that when I'm running on multiple machines, that installation is therefore available to all the machines rather than just one machine. Otherwise, you have to install on every machine, and that's kind of painful. Um, and I also like to install to a directory all by itself. So you saw on the first slide a couple slides ago there where I gave a prefix of $home slash OMPI. The benefit of that is I could just RMRF that whole tree at any time and do a nice, fresh, clean reinstall just to make sure there's no old cruft left over from an old build that expired or, or something like that. So this is actually a very valuable step. You can delete the entire installation tree and they can get a new installation. You never know when things are just going to be stale or, or something went wrong, particularly in a development type of environment. Now, build features, again, you saw on the slide a couple ago that uh, if you know the dash J switch, that is a parallel build. So parallel builds are fully supported. So you can do Mac, make dash J whatever. This means there'll be eight compilations going on simultaneously. Um, so that works fully well. VPath builds also work. Uh, are, are, are fully supported. So you can make a subdirectory, go run, configure, and make in there so you don't pollute the build tree and things like that. Um, that's also fully supported. All the common make targets that you might be used to are also supported. All, install, uh, what else did I leave here? Uninstall, clean, dist, clean, dist, and so on. Uh, they're very GNU-ish like targets, but we support all of them because we use the GNU tools for, for building. Now, what are your requirements? Well, generally, you really just need C compilers and make. Um, but uh, there are a few other things if you're a developer, but I'll get to that in a minute here. But one important thing is to note is that OpenMPI defaults to building with GCC. Again, we use the GNU auto tools, and I'll talk about them in a minute. We use the GNU auto tools for building, and uh, 
they kind of want to run home to mama, so they default building to GCC. But you can use any compiler suite that you want to. So this line here, for example, I show using the ICC compiler suite, which is the Intel compiler suite. But it is important to, if you're going to change one compiler, the C compiler, you also need to change the C++ and Fortran compilers too, because OpenMPI has Fortran and C++ bindings, and it's, you can make it work by mixing compilers, but it's just a whole lot easier if you use the same compiler suite for all three of them. So here I show listing CC equals the Intel C compiler, CXX equals the Intel C++ compiler, and then FC equals the Intel Fortran compiler. Now, that being said, there's a lot of different options to the configure, OpenMPI's configure script. You can run configure dash dash help and get a full and complete listing of all of them. Um, and I'll talk about some of the more important ones in a minute here. But I also recommend that you build on a fast or a local disk, a local file system. Even if you install to a network file system, you will just save your, OpenMPI is a relatively large code base. It's on the order of a half million lines of code. I don't know how many files it is offhand, but it takes a couple of minutes to build even on say a Sandy Bridge machine with a 10,000 RPM disk. So if you're building on a slow network file system, it's gonna take longer. So my recommendation is whenever possible, build on a fast or a local disk and that will just save yourself a lot of time. Another side note, um, again, since we're talking about developers here in development, save your output, all right? When you run configure, when you run make, when you run make install, save all that output because you don't know when you're gonna need to go back and look at something. If something goes wrong and you send an email to the OpenMPI mailing list saying, hey, it didn't work. One of the first things we're gonna do is ask you like, hey, send us the output of configure. Because configure has a lot of diagnostic output in it. There's a lot of good messages about what it's gonna do, what it thinks it's gonna do, what it tried to do, and all that kind of good stuff. So save it all. And then when you do a, you know, a build and it doesn't work, well, we wanna see the build output, particularly the last, I don't know, 100, 200 lines or so where something went wrong. Okay, now this is the born shell syntax for saving both the standard out and the standard error. If you're a C shell kind of person, I will leave that as an exercise to the reader to make sure you save all the right output, but we want to see the standard error and the standard output. All right, so let's talk about some common options to the configure script that we use in OpenMPI. Dash dash disable DL open. Um, what this does is uh, I'll talk about in a bit how about uh, how OpenMPI is built on plugins. We have oodles and oodles and oodles of plugins. But you can disable all those plugins and basically say, oh, you're a plugin? Let's just physically move you into the main library itself so it's not a separate little compilation unit. Um, this is handy in, in some types of scenarios, particularly if you have a terrible parallel file system. Um, this is also a handy option right here, dash dash enable MPI run prefix by default. I'm not verbalizing all the internal dashes there, but you can read them. Um, this is a lot, this is easy if you, let me say that again. This makes it easier if you're using SSH to start your jobs. If you're in a batch environment, uh, like with Slurm or SGE or others like that, this one isn't as important. But if you're using SSH, it kind of makes some things easier. And I'm not gonna go too much more into detail other than that, but if you're with SSH, use that option. You'll save yourself a little pain. Um, you can also disable building some optional parts of OpenMPI. So you can disable building the C++ bindings. You can disable the Fortran bindings. You can disable a third-party tool that we have called Vampire Trace or VT. Um, these aren't mandatory for MPI. Um, and if you're really just working on a new network transport or something like that, you can save a couple of minutes of compilation time by just not building that kind of stuff if you don't care about it. Another one here is enable MPI Java, which is we have uh, the Java MPI bindings. There are no official Java bindings, so we've slurped in an old research project and we're probably gonna be expanding it and so on, but they are turned off by default. So particularly for Greenplum people, if you're gonna be using the Java bindings, you need to actually turn them on by default. And I have another little bit about that uh, coming up as well, but that's one of the base options. Now, OpenMPI can support a lot of different third-party packages, and so we have a lot of options. Uh, basically, OpenMPI's configure script when it runs, it goes and looks and says, oh, do you have verb support? Oh, okay, I'll build verb support. Oh, do you have torque? Oh, I'll build torque support. All these kinds of things. But sometimes you might have the support for those third-party packages installed in non-default locations. So we have a general form right here. So if you do with and then a package name equals a directory. So like, let's say your torque support libraries 
are installed under slash opt instead of you know user lib where it would just find it by default. So you can say where these things are, for example, like with the JDK dir equals over there, or with the verbs, or with valgrind. Uh, Ralph, actually, do you remember why we did, why did we do dir here instead of the general form? Uh, I believe that the reason is because there was a, uh, uh, there's a difference between where the JDK is and where the JDK directory. There's actually two different locations. Ah, uh, okay. Not being a Java guy myself, I don't remember. I'll repeat this for, the, for those watching on the web. There is several different JDK things involved, and one of them is the JDK directory. I'm paraphrasing what you said there. Um, so it's slightly different than the general form, but a lot of these other ones are in the general. And there's, this is only a summary. There's, there's many others that follow the same form. The general philosophy is like what I said before. If OpenMPI's configure script finds, for example, verbs, it'll just build support for it automatically. If it doesn't find verbs, it'll just ignore it. It'll say, oh, okay, you don't have it. I won't build it. But if a user asks for it, so if you say with verbs or with valgrind or something like that, and OpenMPI doesn't find it, then that's an error. Because it said, oh, a human asked me for something, but I could not give it to you. So I'm sorry, that's an error. A, a human's got to figure that out. So normally, we silently find it and build it, or silently don't find it and ignore it. But if you explicitly ask for it and we don't find it, that's an error. All right, a popular shortcut, uh, particularly among my Green Plum colleagues, is something called platform files, where you can roll up lots and lots of configure options into a single file. Um, and it's a very simple text file format. It's just one option per line with an equals in there. So for example, enable MPI Java equals yes. That's exactly equivalent to dash dash enable MPI Java. Um, and turn off Vampire Trace, because Ralph doesn't really care about Vampire Trace very much. He's focusing on other things, so he turns off Vampire Trace and saves himself a little compilation time. But, um, oh, and say, you know, his verbs is uh, installed in a, a different location. So rather than type all this stuff on the command line, he has one file with all these options, and then he can just specify it with dash dash with platform, and it didn't fit here on one line. But for example, dash dash, I'm sorry, dot slash configure, with platform equals green plum MR plus Linux. This is one of Ralph's uh, platform files that are out there. And in this file, actually in particular, uh, there are several other Java options that you put in there to make it build the Java bindings properly. So I listed one on the prior slides. There's actually a couple others, um, but it's all set properly. So you don't have to have a configure command line that's about a mile long. Now, all of this uh, I've been talking about has been with distribution tarballs. Let's talk about a distributor, I'm sorry, a developer build. A developer build where you've done a subversion checkout or a git clone or a, a, a mercurial clone or something like that. We actually require a bit more from developers uh, than we do of uh, distribution tarballs. So developers need to have the GNU auto tools installed. All right, users don't actually need to have these installed at all. But uh, developers need to have, uh, this is as of December 2012, these versions of the GNU Auto Tools listed. All right, and we list these versions on the web page. If you can't read them too closely here, that's, that's fine. It's, there's a table on the website. Now, why is this? Well, we use the GNU Auto Tools for building OpenMPI, and we actually require pretty recent versions of that, right? So older versions of the Auto Tools have bugs. Older versions of the auto tools don't have all the features that we use either. So the auto tools, uh, these guys are actually continually releasing new features and new versions, and we actually take advantage of that stuff. So what you have in your Linux distro, for example, or your OS X laptop might not be recent enough for a developer build of OpenMPI. All right? Now, if you don't have recent enough auto tools, it's actually very easy to get them. They're all available on ftp.gnu.org. Um, and they all have exactly the same configure line. You just do configure and a prefix and then make install. It, it takes you about two minutes to build all four packages that you, that you need. All right, now, a couple warnings with that. Um, recent versions of AutoConf also require a very recent version of M4. I know, we're all shaking our heads going, oh, you're making it so hard for me to compile. Yes, you're right, I'm sorry. This is a, this is a choice that we have made and if you complain to us, we will say, I'm sorry, but you're still gonna need to do this anyway. We're not gonna change this decision. So just to be absolutely crystal clear on that point. But recent versions of AutoConf also require very recent GNU M4 
So you might go and do configure for autoconf and it might fail, say, oh, you need a more recent M4. Also available from ftp.gnu.org, also the same configure and make install. So it might just be easier, just go get yourself the most recent M4, the most recent autoconf, the most recent automake, uh, and, and go from there. Another thing that people have done a couple times is like, oh, they install autoconf in one prefix, automake in a different prefix, libtool in a different prefix. Don't do that. Install them all to the same prefix because they integrate with each other and they use each other's configuration files. It's not worth describing all these things. Just install them all into the same prefix and then life will be good. All right. Also, final warning here, do not overwrite your system installed auto tools. Okay, so your system is going to install autoconf, automake, and libtool and things like that. Do not overwrite them because there are other things that depend on that. You probably want to install somewhere underneath home, so like, you know, dollar home GNU or something like that. Okay, again, I'm making this sound a lot worse than it is. It's actually very easy to go and get your, your own install of the auto tools and things like that, but it is a necessary step. And again, this is for developer builds only. For distribution tarballs, users don't have to do any of this stuff at all. All right. Now, once you have the auto tools built, make sure they're in your path and you run the autogen.pl script. All right. I'll talk more about what this script does in a few minutes, but it basically prepares the tree to be built and it creates that configure script. Once this is done, you are now exactly the same as a distribution tarball. You can just run configure and make just like all the other options I presented a few minutes ago. Now, the last difference between developer builds and uh, distribution builds is that a lot of debugging is enabled by default. So if the configure script sees a .svn, .hg, or .git directory, it says, oh, this is a developer checkout. I'm just going to turn on lots of debugging because I'm going to assume you're a developer and you're going to want debugging kinds of things. Now, it results in quite a bit lower performance. but it's a whole lot easier to debug. All the debugging symbols are there, and we add extra checks and asserts and all these kinds of things. So it really makes it a lot easier for developers to do their normal work, but it does result in lower performance. So many of us, including myself, have made this mistake where you have a debugging build, and you run a benchmark, and you're like, wow, why is the performance so bad? It's because you have a debugging build. It's not an optimized build. So if you want to get an optimized build, well, either build from a distribution tarball, or do a vpath build, or use this configure switch, dash dash with platform equals optimized. Okay, so if you do this or this, even if you're in a, a subversion or mercurial or git checkout, it'll override all of that and do a fully optimized build. Okay? Now, this autogen script, let's talk about what this does. It's actually pretty important. Um, it prepares the tree and it runs all the GNU auto tools. All right, so there's uh, some magic incantations and whatnot that it has to do. But basically, it goes and discovers the entire OpenMPI tree. So it goes and finds all the plugins in the source code and adds it into the auto tool structure and then invokes the auto tools. So one of the requirements from the developers that we had over the years was, I don't want to edit the build system. If I add a new plugin to OpenMPI, I just want to create a directory, put my plugin in there, and the build system should just pick it up. That's what Autogen does. Right, it scans the whole tree and says, oh, you know, Joe put in a new plug in there, so I'll add that to the build system. And then when you run configure and make it, it just does all the right things with that new plug in that Joe put there. All right. Now, you do not need to run this every build. Autogen takes a minute or three, because right, it's got to scan some things, run the auto tools, blah, blah, blah. You do not need to run that every build. You really generally only need to, to rerun Autogen if one of these things changes. So if you change the version file, we need to rerun Autogen. I'm not going to explain why. It's a fairly subtle reason. Doesn't matter why. Just if the version file changes, like we go from 1.7 to 1.7.1 or something like that, you need to rerun Autogen. If you change the top level configure script or any of the sub configure scripts, all the .m4 files, then you need to rerun Autogen. Or if you SVN up, which causes any one of these three things to happen, then you need to rerun Autogen. Okay, but otherwise, you can normally as a developer, just do make, 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 you know, repeated makes and things like that. So let's talk about configure. So particularly for those of you who are not familiar with the GNU auto tools. Um, 
Configure runs in lots of tests. OpenMPI is portable software. Runs on Linux, it runs on OS X, runs on Solaris, runs on Windows, a bunch of other things. So it has to kind of feel around in the system for like, oh, do you have verb support? Oh, you know, what's the byte order of integers? What's, you know, there's a, a bajillion tests that configure runs, right? So it sets up all kinds of pound defines, decides what plugins to build, all these kinds of things. Now, it may take a couple of minutes to run. Particularly, remember, I said before, I, I really recommend that you build OpenMPI either on a local or a fast file system because it's kind of large. Now, again, just like AutoGen, you do not need to rerun it every build. Most of the time, like I said in the previous slide, you can just do repeated makes as one does in, in development cycles. All right. But if you do run AutoGen, then you do need to rerun configure. Okay. So any of those conditions on the previous slide, the version file changed or the top level configure file changed, and you ended up rerunning AutoGen, then you also have to rerun configure. Now, if you add a framework or a plugin, I haven't even told you what a framework is yet, but I'll get to that. But if you add or remove a plugin, you also need to rerun AutoGen and configure. Okay? Now, make. And again, I'm going through the pedantic stuff, but this is just important as a developer working in the tree day to day. These things are, are good to know. Um, make actually does generate a small number of, of files. So we actually have some flex source code in the tree which is basically language parsing stuff for config files. Um, and we have a couple of Fortran modules, which nobody here cares the details of that. But suffice it to say, we actually generate a little bit of code when you run make. Um, a nice feature of our build system is that all the C header file stuff, all those dependencies are auto-maintained for you. So if you add or remove pound includes in your .c files, we'll automatically slurp all that stuff up. Uh, you don't have to change any make files at all. Uh, this is just a, a feature of AutoMake, actually. We can't even claim that we did anything here. But if you edit uh, a .h file, for example, and you do a top-level make, it'll just do the right things for everybody who includes that .h file. Uh, and then, obviously, it builds and installs OpenMPI. Now, where to invoke make? Uh, OpenMPI is actually a pretty big tree. Um, I don't remember offhand how many directories there are, but I would say at least several dozen. Uh, and it's kind of deep. It's at least three or four levels deep. So where do you want to run make? Well, obviously, you can do it in the top level directory. Um, but we also have these things called projects, which is one level down from the top level directory. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. You can invoke make in there in some cases. So you don't have to build the whole tree if you don't want to. You can just rebuild this part of it. Um, and then also, we have directories for individual plugins. So for example, I've been working on a plugin for some Cisco stuff recently. I could just in invoke make and make install in that directory. I don't have to do the whole tree build, which saves lots and lots of time. It's a really, really good thing. Popular targets in here are all and install. This is, these are two targets you'll use all the time, particularly as uh, normal development cycle stuff. Now, what exactly gets installed? Um, remember that OpenMPI, at least to this point, our primary focus is MPI. So basically, we install what people need to compile and run MPI applications. All right, so that includes libraries, plugins, and MPI header files, and things like that. And just as a, to be precise about that, that's MPI.h, MPIF.h, Fortran module files, and things like that. All right. We also install some text config and help files. We're actually big on moving help messages into text files so we don't have to have oodles of printfs, for example, in our source code. Uh, man pages, and then some utility executables like MPI CC, MPI run, things like that. That is what gets installed. Now, more specifically, what does not get installed? All right, autoconf generated config.h files. All right, if you know anything about build systems or the auto tools or whatnot, autoconf actually generates actually multiple .h files in our case. None of those get installed because those are not user visible things. Users do not need those to build and run MPI applications. Um, no header files from plugins or components. No header files from the project core. No libtool convenience libraries. If these words don't mean anything to you, great. Just suffice it to say, none of this internal developer stuff gets installed. Okay? If it isn't needed to compile open MPI applications, we, we generally do not install it. Okay, so now let's talk about the architecture of the OpenMPI code itself, the code base itself. So in our code base, we actually in include 
several third-party packages because we use them. Again, it's open source, so why reinvent the wheel if someone else invented a great one that we can just use, standing on the shoulders of giants and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing that we use is something called Hardware Locality, or HWLoc. Um, it gives us ser server topology and locality information, NUMA nodes, cache sizes, all these kinds of things. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the talk, uh, HWLoc in particular. LibEvent is a popular third-party library out there that does file descriptors and timers and signals and things like this, and it just has a nice engine for processing all of these things. It's a big state machine kind of deal. And then libltdl. libltdl is actually a sub-library of GNU Auto Tool. I'm sorry, GNU LibTool. Uh, it provides a portable way to do DL open, DL sim, basically opening and closing plugins um, because it's surprisingly non-standard across different flavors of POSIX and Windows. Um, and then a complete third-party tool called Vampire Trace. It's by the guys at the University of Dresden. It's an MPI profiling tool. It helps people analyze uh, and measure their performance of MPI applications. So now all of these are configured and built as part of OpenMPI. So when you run that top-level configure and that top-level make, all four of these guys just get configured and built automatically. It's just worth calling out individually uh, that they're there. All right, so let's talk about the code uh, just a little bit. The vast majority of it is C, all right? So uh, a huge portion of it, three quarters of it is C. Um, there's a few flex files in there that generate C. I, I mentioned those briefly before. There's a lot of M4 and SH and AutoConf and AutoMake stuff. Most developers don't have to deal with that. I'm one of the poor schleps who has to deal with the PILD system. But for the most part, this stuff basically uh, just works and your average developer interaction with it is, is pretty limited. There's a few others. There's MPI, Fortran, C++, and, and Java bindings. But these are mostly top-level API calls, and they just call C underneath. So there's not really a lot of meat uh, to that stuff. We're probably going to enter some more Perl and Python sometime soon as uh, some of our colleagues at University of Oregon are modernizing our, our Fortran support. It might be kind of a funny phrase, modernizing Fortran support, but Fortran actually does change over time. Um, this is just some fun statistics that I pulled out recently. Um, there's an open source site called olo.net that uh, provides all kinds of rankings about open source stuff, uh, open source code. Uh, since our subversion is public on the web, they can just mine our subversion for, for data. Um, so they provided these kind of fun statistics. So we have 572,000 lines of code in C, and that does not include comments or blank lines. So that's actually lines of code which is 74% of our code base. And then you can see where it goes down from there. Everything else under there is, is much smaller and not worth repeating. But you can see the vast majority of what we have is C. All this C++ stuff is just the bindings. Those aren't going to change really much at all. So most developers never see this, 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 or this. Most people deal with just that. We do have a couple of conventions. Um, and you'll see at the bottom here, there's too much religious debate, so it's not worth doing much more than this. Uh, but we do have a couple, of, a couple of conventions. So four space tabs, and they're spaces, not tabs. Tabs are evil. We got a, that is one thing that we enforce across the code base. No tabs, only spaces and four space tabs. Um, curly braces go on the first line. Some people hate that. Some people love that. Too bad. In our code base, please put them on the first line. And preprocessor macros are in all uppercase. These are really the only three things that we enforce. Um, everything else, it just ended up in endless debate, and it wasn't worth anybody's time. So we just uh, go with that. Now, we do have some other recommendations uh, that we prefer people to use. We do a lot of defensive programming style. Um, so all blocks, we recommend that all blocks use curly brackets, even one-line blocks, because that can just save you sometimes. Um, you never know when you're going to extend a block to be more than one line and you didn't have the curly brackets and you get unexpected behavior. This is probably the one that freaks people out the most is that we put our constants on the left side of equals equals. All right, so if null equals equals foo. We go, why on earth would you do that? Well, if you leave out one of these equals by accident, you typo it and you just have one equals, right, you'll actually get a compiler error because this is a, a, a not assignable left-hand side. So the compiler will say, hey, syntax error, you can't do that. But if you had done foo on the left, you would have accidentally assigned null to foo, and that could have 
subtle. It could have an obvious implication, but it also might have a very subtle implication. So if you do it this way, you'll actually get a compiler error if you typo. I will tell you, that has saved my keister I don't know how many times. So if you can get over the weirdness of this, uh, it's actually a very, very, very good thing. Functions with no arguments are void. They are not bracket, bracket. Again, we're C. We're not C++. So uh, parentheses, void, parentheses. No C++ style comments. Right? Actually, we do enforce this one. I should have put this on the previous slide. Um, not all C compilers handle C++ style comments properly because we do not yet enforce C99. So no C++ style comments. No GCC extensions either because we compile with non-GCC compilers. Now, that being said, if you're in GCC only code and you've got a pound if or whatever you've done, that's fine. But in general, you just need to be conscious of it. Again, we're portable software, so we have to stay portable. And uh, we, we strongly discourage C++ code in the libraries. We've had users really complain about why do I need a C++ compiler to build OpenMPI? So we've actually eradicated all C++ code from our core. So we really don't want to introduce C++ code in our core anymore. We actually discourage it from our plugins as well. But if you really need to, you really need to. All right. A little more defensive programming. We always define macros. All right. So if you have a logical, like do I have this header file or not? We always define them to be zero or one. We don't define them or not define them, right? That's a common convention like, oh, pound if def I have foo, right? Well, we prefer this one because if you typo in here and you do foo like too long or something like that, you'll actually get a compiler warning about that saying, hey, that macro does not exist. So again, it's, it's very much like the null equals equals foo if you do it just a slightly different way, you'll actually get help from the compiler when you have typos in there. Um, and it, this has given me, saved my keister many, many times as well. Autoconf, unfortunately, uses this convention, if def and, and not if def. So it'll either, it'll either generate the macro, yes, you have that system header file, or not. We can't change that because that's autoconf standard behavior. Right? So that is what we were left there. But for any of the ones that we do, we prefer that. Name conventions. We hate camel case. Please, please, please do not use camel case. Uh, we prefer, we prefer multi-word names, usually full words, not abbreviations, unless it gets absolutely crazy. But something like this, Orte PLM base receive process message. Yes, it's a long name. Yes, it's a lot to type. But you know what? Once we get a little further in this talk, you can look at this name and you'll know exactly what this variable is and where it is in the code base. All right, so we actually have fairly strong conventions about our names here, and it makes the code very readable. Remember, we're an open source community. People are at different organizations. It's not the guy in the cube next to you. So it's got to be someone on the other side of the world can look at that code and say, oh, okay, I have a clue as to what you're doing here. So long names, we use underscores. And we try to avoid abbreviations. Now, again, this first one, you know, at the very end, I did MSG, not message, right? Because it was already six miles long already. So MSG, that was, that was suitable. But when possible, we prefer using full words because it just, an abbreviation makes sense to you. And in your life, you might be a native English speaker. And someone who's reading this is not a native English speaker. So again, try to avoid uh, abbreviations and use full words as, as possible. Now, we have something called the prefix rule in OpenMPI as well. These names need to follow our prefix rule. And I have uh, some slides talking about this coming up here. But basically, it's very important. It says where in the code base it is. Remember I said on the previous slide, looking at that name, I can tell you where that, that variable is instantiated or where that function is located. That's because of this prefix rule thing. Most of our structs are type deft. Uh, we prefer to use short names like See on the end of this line over here, it's umpi foo t instead of struct umpi foo t. That's just kind of the way our code base has grown up, so we prefer to pr preserve that commonality across the code base. Uh, and in typed f names, types end in underscore t, function pointer types end in fn t. All right, these are pretty obvious things, but it, it's worth explicitly stating because we do kind of expect that. 
Now, include statements, again, this is not something most people think about, uh, but system files are in brackets, oompies files are in quotes. All right, so please don't mix the two up. Most system files should be protected with macros. So if, ha oh, this should actually be if def, because that's an autoconf macro. Oops. All right, so note that on the web. This is if def. Um, protect them as necessary because this file does not include, is, does not exist on Windows, if I recall correctly. Um, Oompy files are in this, and we always use the full path name. So opal, MCA base, Oompy group, group.h, and so on. The reasons for that are historical in nature and not really worth going into here, but we basically always do that. It, it prevents ambiguity of header file names because we have at least dozens of header files, and some of them might actually be conflicting in name. So if you did you know, just base.h, we have a lot of base.hs. So specify which one you want. Okay? So we always do the full path name relative to the top of the open MPI tree. Header files are always protected. There's a very rare case here and there where they're not, uh, but generally we do that, you know, the normal, I mean, we've all seen this kind of thing before, right? If it's not defined, then pound define it, have the contents of the header file and end if. We do that for every header file, um, without question. Again, this is obvious stuff, but it's just worth stating. Um, also, we prefer not to put externs in .c files itself, please include the header file that, that actually properly externs it, right? So don't instantiate it yourself, use the top level API header file. Don't prototype file functions either. Compiler warnings. Our position on compiler warnings is that we fix them. Uh, by fixing them, meaning we get rid of them uh, on all platforms and compilers, all right? Not everybody agrees with that, but that is our convention in our community. Um, most of the time, they actually do indicate a problem. This is the philosophy. I don't care whether you agree with it or not. This is our philosophy. Most of the time, they actually indicate a potential problem. So we would prefer an explicit solution to that problem. Um, when you default to a GCC developer build, uh, our configure script will add um, lots of pickiness GCC flags on there. So we'll add dash wall, dash pedantic, and, and several others. Um, now, in some cases, we can't get rid of these warnings. So Open Fabrics header files are a notorious, I think they have a comma on the end of enum lists and other kinds of things like that that are technically correct, but GCC yells about them. We can't do anything about it because these are not our header files. Um, Flex generated code also has some warnings in it. We can't do anything about that because it's generated code. So obviously, in these cases, we can't do anything, but in our code, we prefer that there are no warnings. Okay, now with all the background on our code base, let's actually talk about the code base. Hopefully you can read some of these uh, words on here. Let's just start at the top uh, for a, a, an architecture view of the entire OpenMPI code base. So if this blue pit here is the MPI application itself, well, underneath that is where we live, right? So we live in this green slash black area on this screen here, um, and we have three layers in the OpenMPI project. So there's the OpenMPI layer itself, and then there's the OpenMPI runtime environment, and then the Open Portability Access layer. And we abbreviate these as OMPI, OMPI, ORTE, and OPAL. All right, and now why do I have funny shapes on them? Well, you see here, they all actually touch the operating system uh, as well. So this is our main interaction. OPAL is our main interaction to the operating system, but ORTE touches the operating system, and so does OMPI as well. And then there's actually one more layer underneath that, which is the hardware itself. And you see that OpenMPI actually touches the hardware as well. Okay, the MPI layer. Now, the MPI API is the only publicly exported API. Again, at least to this point, where our, our, our main product has been focused on providing an MPI environment for applications. So we have only cared about the MPI API. Before, when I was talking about the ABI guarantees that we provide, the ABI guarantees are here. Not here, here, or here. It's just here. All right, so we change all kinds of things in here all the time, but we provide a stable interface um, that will link or that will work across different versions of OpenMPI, but just at that MPI API layer. And then down here, each project, we call these projects or layers. You'll hear me use both words 
uh, interchangeably here. But each project both touches the operating system and the OOMPI layer touches the hardware for optimization purposes. Again, as I said in the beginning, this is used in high performance computing, right? So optimization and nanoseconds matter. So where relevant, these guys do touch the operating system and the hardware. Okay. Now let's talk about each of the three layers and what they are. Right, so there's the OOMPI layer, and it's pronounced OOMPI. <laughs> it's basically the public MPI, API, and all the logistics that are necessary to make that happen. So there's some rules about you know, how messages are matched and you know, what groups are and things like that. All that stuff is up in the MPI layer. The layer below that is ORTE. Um, some people like to say ORT. That is wrong. It is ORTE. <laughs> um, this layer has no knowledge of MPI whatsoever. This is basically the parallel runtime system. So it launches you know, end processes and groups them together all into one cohesive job. We call it a job, right? So it monitors them, it launches them, uh, it routes the standard out and standard error and standard in around, all these kinds of things. There's a lot of services that Orte does, but a very crass description of it is that it's the parallel runtime system that supports the MPI layer. Okay. And then the last layer down at the bottom is Opal. Um, it only understands single processes. Okay, so Orte is the thing that does multiple processes. Opal only does single processes. It's got a bunch of portable OS level functionality like Atomics, um, like uh, IP interfaces, things like that. Uh, all the hardware locality stuff is down there. And it's got a whole lot of basic utilities like linked lists and classes and, and various things like that. So all of our utility glue code uh, that you need is down there. So if you need a bitmap, for example, we have bitmaps down in Opal. You can just use those in any of the other layers. All right, here's what it looks like. Oh, more specifically, I showed this picture before, right? So this is the MPI layer, this is the Orte layer, this is the Opal layer. Each one of these guys is a separate library, right? So this is lib, <laughs> it's actually lib MPI, not lib OMPI. Uh, lib open RTE and lib open PAL. <laughs> Little historical note. It used to be lib Orte and lib Opal. And was it IBM? IBM had a problem with lib Opal? They already had a lib Opal, I think, in Red Hat 4 or something like that. And so we had a conflict, so we had to change the names to lib open RTE and lib open PAL. Now, because of this, it's very important to understand the dependencies. Dependencies go downward only. Again, it's pretty obvious, but it's worth stating, right? Lib open MPI can use anything in Orte and Opal, right? Opal cannot use something in open MPI, obviously. The violation will be published or public punished by the linker, right? So if, if you try to use some variable that's up here, the linker just won't even let lib opal link, lib open PAL, okay? But we did it basically as three separate libraries as a way to enforce the abstraction differences and the abstraction separation between these three projects. And so the linker does a great job of enforcing that for us. Now, each of these projects is, is structured very similarly in the code base, right? So there's a main core code, right, with a bunch of logic for that layer. Um, and then we have components, or otherwise known as plugins, for that layer that support the main core for that, for that layer. And then uh, something that we call frameworks. And I'll talk about frameworks here in a second as well. Now, plugins are a fundamental design decision of the OpenMPI code base itself. So it kind of pervades everything that we do. So we have, I don't even know how many, minimum of dozens, uh, maybe even 100 or two different plugins in, in OpenMPI. Um, and they are governed by what we call the Modular Component Architecture, or MCA. Here's a different architectural view of our code base. All right, so just for reference, you see that MPI application at the top again. And then here I broke it out individually. See the MPI API. That is all that the MPI application is aware of. And again, this is where the ABI guarantees are. Nothing below that. All right. Then we have this modular component architecture. And underneath there, we have all these frameworks. A framework is basically a type of plugin. Right, so let's say this is for point-to-point -point communication. This is for starting remote processes. This is for group communication, and so on and so on and so on. We have lots and lots of different frameworks in OpenMPI. Now, just to give this 
uh, a comparison here. Remember what the previous architecture view was, right? So we have the three projects here. And again, for reference, the MPI application. Let's kind of combine those and see what I'm talking about. So again, these are architectural views. This is not exactly how it works at runtime. This is basically how we have the code organized and, and laid out. All right, so the MPI application again at the top, and then we have all the cores of all three layers, right? So the UMPI, Orte, and Opal core, and then each one of those cores has their own frameworks, and each one of those frameworks has their own plugins, otherwise known as components. So let's give it some specifics, some specific examples, that is. Um, I put in some names of some actual frameworks and some actual plugins here, uh, just again as some examples. So like this is the MPI byte transfer layer, which is our point-to-point -point communication system. MPI collective operations, process launching, how to get IP interfaces, distributed file system, and so on and so on. Now under here, you see there's a lighter colored one which is labeled base. Base is a little special, I'll talk about base in a few minutes. Uh, but then underneath all of these we have one or more plugins. So in the MPI byte transfer, like there's a TCP one and a shared memory one and, and a variety of other plugins. Um, what's another good one here? Process launch. You can launch by RSH or SSH, or you can launch under a batch scheduler called Slurm or others and so on. I won't go through all of these here, but just suffice it to say that this was not an arbitrary architecture decision. This is something that pervades the entire code base, and we do it for a very specific reason, because we use it all over the place. All right, so why did we do that? All right, well, there's a couple reasons for that. It, it has lended itself to better software engineering because we enforce strict abstraction barriers. So the, the point to point stuff is completely contained in that framework and those plugins. There's no bleed over to other places, right? It's all contained in there. And process launching, you know, RSH does not impact Slurm because they are separate plugins. And we had to think really hard about what is the API going to be there? If you've ever worked with plugins before, you know that a plugin is a multiple implementations of the same API. So we had to think really hard about what are these upward facing APIs from the plugins going to be? What is the lowest common denominator? What are the special features that we're going to need? All that kind of stuff. So it really kind of enforces thinking about the design before you actually do it. So this was a very good thing. Also makes kind of small discrete chunks of code. Again, the TCP point to point stuff completely separate from everywhere else. Right? I could go break the TCP stuff and it won't affect the open fabrics or the shared memory or the other transports and things like that. So it kind of makes, it reduces the maintainability burden, particularly because we're a distributed community of developers all across the world as well. Right? Um, and it also has a side effect of separating applications from the back end libraries. So there's a, a lib verbs, for example, for doing open fabrics types of things user applications are actually not compiled against libverbs. User applications are linked against libmpi. Libmpi loads a plugin which is linked against libibverbs. And it actually has some nice implications for doing upgrades behind the scenes without changing user codes. Ralph. One other point that you don't have on there is that uh, the use of plugins allows different users to have, have completely different implementations for the exact same thing. So, if you, for example, disagree or, or want to play with a different way of doing an RSH-based launch system, you can write your own. And we don't Excellent have to point. agree on it or, or have a big debate about it. You just write point. your own and use it. I'm going to repeat that uh, for the audio for the, for the video here. Ralph was bringing up the point that I don't have on the slide here that, uh, and this has happened a lot in the developer code base, that uh, someone says, hey, I don't like plugin X. I think you could do it better a different way and they go re-implement it a different way and we can then compare and contrast them because it's they can just copy that plugin and modify it or change it or re-implement it and so on so users can have different implementations of the same plugins uh, and it really makes it easier to do development that way Is that a good summary okay all right let's talk about the MCA here and particular the layout of it so again MCA modular component architecture the thing that kind of governs our whole plugin system. So MCA is the top level architecture for our component services and it finds, loads, unloads, and does all the uh, accounting and maintenance for dealing with plugins, basically. It's the thing that DL opens them and DL closes them and all that kind of stuff. Opens directories to find plugins, all that kind of junk. Frameworks are a targeted set of functionality. Again, I described frameworks earlier as a group of plugins, right? So 
the point-to-point plugins, the MPI collective plugins, the process launch plugins, things like that. But in more generic terms, it's called a targeted set of functionality, right? And it has defined interfaces to it. So when you write a point-to-point plugin, these are the interfaces that you have to write for TCP, for shared memory, for open fabrics, and so on. Um, they're basically, like I said, a grouping of plugins. And uh, I gave a couple examples there. Another one I haven't cited before is high resolution timers. We have a plugin for that. Components are basically code that exports a specific interface, right? Again, I think we all know what these are. These are uh, uh, more, I would say, academic descriptions of what these things are. And they're usually loaded and unloaded at runtime. Now, OpenMPI actually does have a mode where it can say, don't compile them as plugins, but actually include them in libmpi, right? So they would normally be a plugin, but it can just be physically slurped into the main libraries. So that's why I said usually there at the end. And modules, now this is, this is a distinction that's kind of important to understand in our, our code base. So components are usually what we call plugins. A module is basically a component paired with resources, right? So, for example, we have a TCP component for point-to-point. -point, but what if I have multiple TCP interfaces on my box, or more specifically, IP interfaces on my box? Well, we will actually instantiate that component twice, once with ETH0 and once with ETH1. Okay, so it's kind of like class and object in C++. Right, so class is the thing that you have one of, but you have, might, might have multiple instantiations of it as objects. Right, so... This nomenclature is used quite a bit in the MPI layer, and it's starting to be used more in the Orte layer now, too, as well. Um, and we definitely use it in the Opal layer as well. So the difference between these two is kind of important to, to understand. All right, so just to bring that all back together, just to show this picture again here again, MPI guy at the top for reference. Here's the core, all the frameworks and the components underneath. Say this guy is the TCP component he might actually have multiple modules hanging off of him at the bottom. All right, so let's talk about the organization of these things. Frameworks have to have unique string names. All right, so we identify these in the code base by their string name. So the organization of frameworks and, and components is not a high performance operation, right, because we're using strings. Uh, so this is usually done during bootstrapping and finalization and things like that. So string names is, is a, a perfectly fine way of, of referencing these things. Components belong to exactly one framework. You will never have a component that belongs to this framework and that framework. That is just not the way our architecture is. It's a whole lot easier to have single inheritance. Um, they also have unique string names. You cannot have two point-to-point -point components named TCP, for example. You can have TCP and TCP2 or TCP Bob, you know, whatever. But you cannot have two components named TCP. Um, the namespace is per framework, though. So you can have a TCP point-to-point -point framework and a TCP out-of-band, I'm sorry, you can have a TCP point-to-point -point component and a TCP out-of-band component, but because they're in different frameworks, right? So the scope of this unique name is, is per framework. Now, they must also be valid C++ or C variable names. So you couldn't have a component named C++, for example, unless it was the words C, P, L, U, S, P, L, U, S. Okay. So you can't use a dash in them, you can't use punctuation, all these things. They be, must be very valid variable names, and you'll see why in a few minutes. All right. They're organized by directory, all right. and here's how it is laid out. If you remember, we have three projects, Opal, Orte, and Umpi. That is the first level directory name, and then there's the, the hard-coded name MCA, then there's a framework name, and then the component name, and that is where it lives in the file system itself. So again, Project Opal over to The framework is either the framework name or base and component name or base. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about base in a second here. Uh, the directory names must match, right? So if I have a TCP component, then this directory must be TCP, right? And if I have a framework named BTL, then this framework directory name must be BTL, okay? That's how we reconcile the file and build system with what happens at, uh, at runtime. So for example, umpi MCA BTL TCP and umpi MCA BTL SM. SM is shared memory. All right, now base is a little special case. Base is where the glue code 
for that framework itself is. It's not a plugin. It's the base. It's the foundation for that framework. So for example, Opal MCA base, that's actually the MCA itself. All the stuff that does deal open, deal close, all that stuff. Uh, the PLM frameworks base is Orte MCA PLM base. So all of its companion plugins are in directories right next to that here, but the base itself is right there. And then another one, BTL base and so on. So there's helper header function files there that uh, the rest of the core can call uh, from here. Uh, there's common code that the components themselves can, it's all the glue code that you need in that framework itself, whatever, whatever you happen to need, okay? So let's look at the directory layout here in a more interactive thing. So here's the top open MPI directory. And in there, we have a bunch of files like a readme and a news and so on. And then the three project directories, Oompi, Opal, and Orte, or Orte and Opal. So if we go into the Opal directory, you'll see we have a bunch of code directories, assembly code, class code, config, data type, a bunch of others. And then this MCA directory, let's look at MCA. Under MCA, you see all the frameworks that exist down in Opal. So we have backtrace, base, oh, there's the Opal base itself, or the MCA base itself, Compress, CRS, Event, HWLOC, several others, and Timer, and so on. So these are all frameworks that exist down in Opal. And then let's go look at the Timer framework. And you see we have all these implementations, all these plugins for Timer under Opal, AIX, Altix, and so on and so on. Right? Basically, every operating system has you know, different APIs for doing high-resolution timers. Right? And then if you go into, for example, the Linux guy here, Here's his actual source code for this plugin. There's a make file, a configure file, a header file, and a .c file. Okay? So, what it comes down to, Opal, MCA, Timer, Linux, and that maps to Project MCA Framework Component. Okay? Now, let's drive that point home. Let's do it again. TCP, BTL, right? So we go into the open MPI, you see he's got a different set of code stuff under there, but he's again got that MCA. Under MCA, he's got all the open MPI frameworks. Under the BTL framework, he's got all of his plugins. And under there, we have the TCP plugin, and then all of his code. And he's actually got a whole pile of .c and .h files. It's not just as simple as the timer guy over there. But it all comes down to the same thing. We were then two different projects. But it gets mapped the same way. Oops, I didn't mean to go that far, sorry. Oompi, MCA, BTL, TCP. Okay, maps to the same project MCA framework component. And again, it was a little tedious. I went through two examples. But just to prove the point that even though we are in two entirely different parts of the tree, the structure is the same. Okay. And again, just to tie that back in here, basically you can see that each one of these basically represents a different level of directory in the source code tree, right? So Oompi, Orte, and Opal, that's the first level directory, and then MCA, and then the framework name, and then the component name. So there's a reason this diagram actually represents our code tree very well. It actually maps very well to the directory structure as well, okay? And then if you remember the very first one I put up here, the BTL and TCP, for example, and collective operations and tuned and PLM and RSH and so on. These are actually directory names in the tree. Okay, so that's directory structure. Let's talk about header file conventions. And again, still talking about the MCA here. So the framework interface itself is designed in project MCA framework framework.h. Okay, so BTL slash BTL.h, for example. This is mandatory. We require that any framework that exists also has framework.h. Right? Now, the public base functions are typically declared in MCA framework base base.h. This is not universal, although it's near universal. A couple frameworks did a little differently. But for the most part, you can find all the public stuff that you want to call in the framework base itself, whether you're out in the core or whether you're down in a component itself are in that base.h. Now, again, this is common, but not mandatory. And there are a handful of other .h files in various bases that you might want to include that directly, not base.h. You look like you really want to say something, Ralph. 
I was only going to point out uh, that the framework.h file is where the API is defined for that framework. All the plugins use that API to implement point. that API. Yes. So if you need to find the API for that per for a particular function like process launch, you'd look at pln pln.h, and that's the API that's available. Great point. So just repeating this for the video here, uh, the point that Ralph was making was that in this file itself is where the API for the components and the plugins is located. So if you're going to write a new plugin for a framework, go look in this file and you'll find all the functions that you need to implement and descriptions of what they're supposed to do. So taking us back to this one here, just to throw it back in here. So BTL, BTL, there you go. You see there's a BTL.h in that directory. I didn't show that before when I, in my previous slides. And then the base, oh, another guy right there. See, BTL, BTL.h. And then the base, see there's a BTL base, and then a base.h. Okay. And again, there's a bunch of, you know, the base might have a bunch of .c and .h files depending on what that base does, uh, but generally base, base.h is there. Now, components, I've given some kind of amorphous definitions about what some of these things are. Um, if you've never worked with plugins before, this may seem like kind of a weird uh, way of doing things, but the back-end component magic is all done by function pointers, right? So we DL open something, and then you can't just call a function in there. You actually have to look up a, fun a pointer to its functions and then invoke that through a pointer to it, right? So these, as I mentioned before, our plugins are usually compiled separately. They're DSOs, dynamic shared objects. Now, sometimes they can be part of libmpi, but let's not talk about that situation now. They're usually as dynamic shared objects, um, and we use this libltdl library to look up, say, hey, what is a pointer to this variable that's in uh, that plugin, or this function, or whatever. So everything has to be accessed indirectly. Now, uh, this even works on Windows, and even though we're using a GNU libtool library, it's not GPL, uh, which is actually a very important thing because OpenMPI is BSD, and we're vendor friendly and all these things like that. So we are not tainted by using a GNU library here, which is a very good thing. Um, but this is kind of an important concept to remember that everything is done through indirection. And this has implications into something that I'm gonna call the prefix rule coming up here in, in a few minutes. But uh, just remember this point that because of plugins, we do everything through indirection. All right, now let's talk about the implementations of plugins themselves. We do have a couple of requirements, right? You have to have this configure.m4 file and a makefile.am, and that's to tie into our upper level build system. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of this. There's actually a detailed uh, wiki page about, hey, you wanna add a component? Here's how you make this configure.m4, here's how you make this makefile.am, here's how you make the rest of your component uh, kinds of things. But these, these are required. Now, beyond that, though, uh, you can do whatever you want. The plugin can be implemented any old way that you want to. You can have as many C and H files. You can have subdirectories. You can do whatever you want. The ones I've showed before were relatively simplistic and had a few .c and .h files, and that's what most of our plugins are. But there's a couple of plugins that actually have a whole tree underneath them because they're relatively complex implementations of things. Um, but really, all that we care about is that you create a shared library file that can be DL open that's named MCA framework component.so. Or in some cases, it's named a little differently so that it gets slurped into libmpi. But basically, a, a DL openable file. For example, MCA BTL TCP, MCA PLM RSH, and so on. So, how you write your code to implement that defined interface, don't care. All I care is that you make this thing that I can DL open you at runtime. Now, every framework is unique about what their API is going to be, right? So the MCA is, is very well defined, but then every framework is unique about what it needs and what it does, right? So the timer framework, for example, we don't call that through function pointers because the whole point is to be very high resolution, and to call through a function pointer would kind of negate that. So the, the, the timer framework is based on header files. Um, so that we include that directly and call the functions directly rather than through a function pointer. Um, the BTL framework allows lots of BTLs to be open simultaneously and use them all. Um, the process launch framework only allows one component to be opened at a, at a time. 
uh, and so on. So they all have different requirements and, and different things of, of what they do based on, on, on what their needs are. Um, there is a lot of commonality in their structure, but their actual functionality is, is different. Um, and so that's why I'm kind of using these amorphous terms to describe them, and I hope it's still coming through. Now, the component interface, as we mentioned on the previous uh, slide, a couple slides ago, is defined by the framework itself, right? Typically, if you look at the, the life cycle of a component, there is a framework will go find all of the components that are available and then do some kind of selection. Which one do I want to use? Or which ones do I want to use, for example? So some kind of selection function. And the framework goes along and asks each component, hey, do you want to be used with X? And X is different for every framework. X is some kind of scope, right? So in the process launch, X is this process, right? So it says, hey, do you want to be used with this process? And the component will say yes or no. Right? If it says no, then we just close it and, and forget that plugin for the rest of this process. But X might be uh, something more fine-grained than the process. In the MPI, we have this group called a, a concept called a communicator. And you can have lots of communicators per in, even in a single process. So X might be communicator. It might be, hey, do you want to be used with this communicator? And he might say yes or no. And if he says no, well, we don't close him and throw him away because he might be used with a different communicator elsewhere in the process. Um, and so on. So I just went through those two examples there. So let's look at a typical life uh, cycle of a component and module pair. Um, there are many variations of this, but this is kind of the general scheme here, right? So in the beginning of time, a component is DSO opened, right? So deal opened or whatever it is on, on, on that operating system. Um, and then there is an open function call or an open hook, if you want to call it that way, that we say, hey, component, go ahead and do whatever you need to initialize yourself. And the component does some things, or, or not. The component might say, I've got nothing to do. That's fine. Um, and then there's this kind of selection process. And again, this is per scope. So it might be once per process, or once per communicator, or once per X uh, kind of thing. Now, if that component wins the selection process, uh, the framework will say, hey, give me a, a module. And the component will create a module and send it back. And there's another hook in that module for initialization. Initialization means you won, you're going to be used. Do whatever you need to initialize yourself and prepare yourself for use. Now, everything from here and above might be slow, right? It's okay to be, I need to do some expensive system calls, I need to go probe the system, I need to go find hardware, whatever, because this is all usually done at the beginning of time or the beginning of a scope or, or something like that. This is where 90% of the usage is, right? So whatever that component does, you know, point to point communication, group communication, whatever it is that it does happens here. And this is what we want to optimize for so that this step can be really, really fast, All right? And then at the end, there's a hook for closing down the module and then another hook for closing down the component, right? So they can free all their resources and uh, basically be, be released properly. Now, total topic shift away from, from components here. Let's talk about make. This goes into directory structure. I probably should have put this a few slides earlier, but this is where it ended up. Um, where to run make. We talked about this earlier. Um, we can do a top level make. And now that we've talked about the directory structure, I wanted to just flesh out what this means, right? So if I do a top level make, it makes everything. It makes all three of those directories, right? But I could also go down into a project directory. But when I do that, it only builds that one project directory, right? So if I CD into Opal and I do make all, it's only going to make lib open pal, right? Conversely, if I CD into Orte, it's only going to make lib open RTE. But the thing you got to be aware of is that lib open RTE and lib MPI wholly include the other projects. There are very esoteric and terrible linker reasons why this is true. Um, they don't just depend on each other and link to each other. They actually include each other. Really long story about why this is true. I mean, you, normally you would think, well, just open RTE links against that and lib MPI links against lib open RTE. For esoteric reasons, we can't do that. So, if you just rebuild 
lib open RTE, be sure you also go rebuild lib MPI. Right? Because if you rerun an MPI application, it's not going to see the new lib open RTE because you didn't create a new lib MPI. So this is a big gotcha and it's weird. I admit that it's weird. I'm not going to go into the reasons now about why we did that, but they are unfortunately completely necessary. Um, but if you need to rebuild a project lib, be sure to go build, rebuild the projects above it. All right, so that's why I gave a disclaimer like, yes, you can just do a make in the top level project directory, but make sure you do the other ones as well. Okay. Now, I also mentioned this one earlier too. You can go into individual component directories and you can do make all or in, make install down there and it saves you a lot of time. So I mentioned I was making a Cisco specific plugin for point to point communication. Um, I could just go all the way down into Oompy, MCA, BTL, my Cisco plugin. And just do make all. It compiles about 10 files and I'm done. Right? I don't have to build the entire tree of almost 600,000 lines of source code. Right? So when I'm debugging and developing, this just saves so much time. Uh, it is a, a wonderful thing. So you can see an example of that here. Going into the TCP, BTL, just make install. And it's not just make all install, it's any of the targets, right? So uninstall all the others. Now, we have several wiki pages about this kind of stuff. Um, again, we'll put these in the links on the, uh, the web page where this video is. But the role of autogen, I talk, there's, there's interesting things that um, you probably, you don't need to know the details of, but being familiar with it is a good thing. How to add a component, how to add a framework. Uh, these are all, everybody should go read these kinds of things. Well, actually, definitely read how to read it, add a component. Some people care about adding a framework as well. Okay. Now, something I referred to earlier, and I said I would talk about it, now is the time to talk about it, is this thing called the prefix rule. Public names and symbols must be prefixed. Remember, we're middleware, right? This is a library. User applications link against us. So we need to make sure to not conflict against their symbols. Don't have a global variable named I, for example. But we do this by enforcing a, a strict prefix on just about everything. Now, in the context here, I'm talking about inside components, right? So project framework, component, and then the name that you're doing. And that's the usual form that we do things, right? There are a small number of places where we just do framework and component, um, and there's one case where we do MCA framework and component. This is the component structure I itself. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's one of these two right here, uh, and that kind of guarantees that we won't collide A with ourselves and B with user applications. All right, now a historical note, um, this project prefix was really only added recently, this one. This guy up here. Um, that's why a lot of them are still this way, but there's a, this is the new way, the better way. All new code should do that. But there's still a lot of old code that does it the old way. All right. um, so all new names should be done that, and this will generally be fixed over time. There's a guy at Los Alamos who's doing a bunch of cleanup right now. We might see if we can con him into updating all this code. This is uh, kind of grunt work to go fix this, but uh, a problem came up that it made it necessary that we needed to add that prefix, or project prefix. So hypothetically, we'll get that fixed over time. All right, so let me give some examples of this. Opal timer Linux init. Knowing what you know now about the code base and how we're laid out, you know right where that code lives, right? It's in the Opal project. It's in the timer framework. It's in the Linux component. You could go to a single directory and grep for that file, for that function and find it. Okay, these are other reasons why we also do this prefix rule because it really gives the locality of where that thing is. Right? Orte PLM RSH started. Again, you can just go find that. That's just a, a variable. This actually isn't a public symbol. Um, well, it's pseudo public. Um, but it's in the RSH PLM component in the, in the Orte project directory. Right? Here's a file name. Oh, wait a minute, file names? Who cares about file names? Well, remember that file names get compiled to .o files, right? and .o files are then conglomerated into library files. We can't have library files that have the same name. I'm sorry, .o files that are the same name in a library. So the prefix rule also applies to our own internal file names. All right, that's 
not well appreciated, but uh, that it is a fact. Right? So prefix rule applies there as well. Right? Now, this is one of the places where we really should have oompy btl tcp component.c, but that's the way it is. Hopefully we'll get that Los Alamos guy to clean it up. All right, and this is actually, I just said this right here, so the reason it applies to file names is because of that as well. All right, and we don't want them to, yeah, so the file names apply there. All right, now, in the core, this applies as well. So previously I've been talking just about components, right, saying the prefix rule applies to components. Here's the things you need to put in in front of all the public symbols, variables, types, names, um, all these kinds of things. But in the core itself, we also have to do that, because again, we're middleware, right? So uh, we subset as appropriate, you just use the, the, the project name. For example, here's a function, oompy free list init, right? That's not an MCA thing, that's not a framework or a component thing, but you can tell it's in the oompy project, and you know, you know that's not an MCA, so actually you can find pretty well where that's gonna be pretty easily with a couple of greps, um, or your tags, or whatever. Um, variable, here's another one, Orte PLM base. Okay, technically, that's not in a component. It's in a framework, but it's not in a component, right? So this is in the Orte PLM base directory itself. And there's a reason there's a variable that has the base name and so on. And then type opal list he and so on. So all of these things, we have at least umpi, orte, or opal as the prefix. And we kind of reserve that and one or two others. Those are the only prefixes that we export out of our directory that might conflict with user applications. All right, and the same rationale applies to all the rest. Can't conflict with ourselves, can't conflict with the user. All right, and I've already beat on this a couple times, right? Um, we're middleware. We really only want to make public what you have to, right? Mo we actually default, we have set the compilers to default to private symbols. So if you have just a, a, a foo function <coughs> and you call it from outside of that .c file, you'll get a failed link because that symbol will be hidden. So we have a macro um, that we stole inspiration from Windows actually, it's called decal spec, that you put in front of everything that you want to be visible outside of a, dot, a given .o file. Right? So if it's an orte symbol, you do orte decal spec and then the type and then the variable. So this is just a macro that goes in front of any, any declaration, right? So whether it's a function or a variable or, or whatever. So we have orte decal spec, umpi decal spec, and opal decal spec. Um, and also remember that components are invoked by function pointer. So therefore, they don't need to be public symbols, right? The only symbol that we actually look up is one top level struct in every component. And that has a well-defined name and that guy must be public. But everything else is a function pointer inside there, so we're never going to be looking up those symbol names. So if you only use symbol names within a single .c file, don't make it public. Make it static. There's no reason. Okay, a couple other notes here. Um, beware of Linux and GCC specificisms. Uh, this is a very easy trap to fall into. Like I've been doing 99% of my development work on Linux, I don't accidentally realize that this is a Linux specific thing. We allow this kind of stuff, but we really want non-portable code like that to either go in a pound if or in a, a separate plugin. We actually have some GCC specific plugins. All right. Another weirdo thing, um, and that's because of Max and OS 10, if you have a .c file, there has to be code in there that is actually invoked, all right? You can't just have like a constants.c and just list all your public variables or something like that. That will actually get chopped out by the OS 10 compiler. It's a weird thing, but that is the way it is. It'll work great on Linux, and then you go to use it on a, on a Mac laptop or something, and it, it'll, you'll get failure to link errors. So all .c files must have code that is actually invoked or called. All right, the next section here is about runtime parameters. Um, runtime parameters is actually a, par a fairly important concept to OpenMPI as a whole. Um, our philosophy kind of is, whenever possible, don't use constants in the source code. Instead, we use runtime parameters. We actually have power users that want to adjust a lot of things at, at, at runtime. Um, now, we've referred to these as MCA parameters, but that's kind of a misnomer. Although that name is, it's kind of stuck now. Uh, it's too late to change that name. 
it, it means that it's a service provided by the MCA base. It doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, it affects how plugins work and things like that. Well, it kind of does, but not really. But um, it doesn't also mean that it's restricted to MCA. We actually use MCA parameters in the core as well, for example. So the Orte, Umpi, and, and Opal projects themselves have MCA parameters. Now, the rationale here is that we want to make as much be a runtime decision as possible. Um, so we want to have parameters for all kinds of things. And you want to give it a sensible default value, right? So if the user doesn't specify what that value is, it should be something reasonable, sensible, and so on. But whenever possible, make it a runtime decision. Now, these are the types of things that we usually do with these MCA parameters, right? They either it's a value, like an integer value, like what is the trade-off between a short and a long message, for example. Um, or it's a behavior. Which algorithm do you want to use for a broadcast? You know, algorithm number one or number seven? Uh, stuff like that. It's a lot easier than going and changing a pound to find, recompiling, and then rerunning your app. It's a lot easier to just rerun the app and, and specify something different on the command line. And our users have told us over the years that they absolutely love this about OpenMPI. They can run one way, benchmark it, then run a different way with a different command line parameter and benchmark that. But it's the same application. You know, they haven't recompiled or changed anything. They just changed something on the command line and they can do a you know, performance shootout, for example, of a bunch of different parameters. Now, there is an intrinsic MCA parameter, the framework name. Um, each framework, its name is an MCA parameter in itself, and it specifies which plugins or components to use. Right? So now the MCA base automatically registers this, for example. We'll just jump down here to the examples. BTL, for example, you could say MCA BTL and give it a comma delimited list of the plugins that you want to use. So TCP, comma self, comma SM. SM is shared memory. Self is process loopback. Right? Or you can do the negative version of this, and if you put a caret as the first character, you could say TCP. So it's everything except TCP. All right, so there's the inclusionary way and the exclusionary way. And every framework, uh, their name is automatically registered to do this. And the MCA base just takes care of this. Now, MCA parameters are also very flexible in that they can be specified in a number of different places. So the first place it can be specified is you can actually set it via API in the OpenMPI code base itself. So we call this the override value. Ignore everything else and just do what I told you to do. All right, we use this, in fact, I'm not sure if we use this anywhere, but the capability is there uh, in case it, it's needed. Most times people set it on the MPI run command line, right? So they do dash dash MCA and then a name and then a value. Okay, so you can say, oh, run with the TCP BTL, then run again and use the Open Fabrics BTL, uh, and so on. Uh, other people set it in environment variables. So you can set in, and this is the, the C shell format, do export if you're a bash kind of person, um, umpi underscore MCA underscore name followed by value. But this is exactly the same name here and exactly the same value there. All right? So if you set in this and then do MPI run without the dash dash MCA, it's the exact same effect, okay? except this one has a higher priority than that one. So if you specify the same name on both, number two will obviously take priority. Then we also allow you to set it via file. And we have two default locations for file. Um, one is in the user's home directory, and the other is in a system-wide directory. So a system administrator can set some defaults for their users if they want to, for example. And then the last one is the default value. So if none of these are specified, then it'll use whatever the default value was. Now, the characteristics of MCA parameters, we only have two types. We have strings and integers. People have argued over the years, like, oh, we should add floating points, too. No one's come up for a case where we needed floating points, so we've never added it. So strings and integers all we have, and we have two kinds of those. They can be read-only, or they can be read-write. Read-only is usually for providing information that uh, I want to say, oh, what version of, of verbs were you compiled against, for example? So it's providing information to the user just for information value. And read-write is uh, like things that I specified before, you know, size of short versus long messages and things like that. Now, fair warning, lookups are slow. These are not to be used in the critical performance path. Right? These are only, you know, look at these 
at the beginning of a scope, for example, the beginning of a process or, or things like that. So just be aware that you want to look it up and cache the value in a local variable. It's a lot faster that way. Here's some examples. I've kind of gone through these already. All right, if I want to say what version of verbs you were linked against, here's a, a fun one. In the TCP BTL, which is our point-to-point -point communication mechanism, I have something for which interfaces I want you to use. I want you to use ETH2 only, or ETH2 and ETH3, right? Or not ETH0, or whatever. That's what this variable is for. So it's a read-write string of IP interfaces. Uh, this is a framework one, an intrinsic one that I mentioned before. You can list which BTLs to use. And uh, here is a info one that says whether this function, I'm sorry, whether this process is alone or not. And that's all the description I'm going to give of it right now. <laughs> it's more complicated than that, but you get the idea. All right, side note on that. We have a command called umpi info umpi underscore info. How many times over the years have I wanted to change that to umpi dash info? But unfortunately, it is umpi underscore info, and a lot of people have that in scripts, and so we can't really change that now. But it tells you everything about your umpi installation. It tells you what version it is, when it was compiled, who compiled it, is there Fortran support. It just gives you all this information about your OpenMPI installation. It also shows you all the plugins that are available and all of their parameters. Right, so it's a great way to look up like, oh, I'm using the TCP BTL. How can I tune that guy? Well, you can go up and look and see what all the tunable parameters are for any given plugin um, and then use that for your advantage. So for example, you can say umpi info dash dash param and you give it a framework name and a component name and it'll show you all the parameters for that plugin. Right? You can also use all, right? So you could say, show me um, the BTL framework, all the components, and it'll show you everything for every plugin that it finds. All right. Key point, it shows you the parameters and it shows you where the parameters were set. So for example, if you have, if the system administrator sets some default parameter value in that system-wide file, it'll tell you that it was set in the file as opposed to being set on the command line or an environment variable or something like that. So if you're running and you get unexpected behavior, you can look in here and say, oh, it's because the sysadmin set this value that I wasn't aware of. There's also a dash dash parsable option uh, that's so you can feed this output into scripts and do parsable kinds of things. Um, surprisingly, this is unexpectedly useful. Um, I know a lot of people have written scripts looking at the output of UPI info and saying, oh, which ones can I, they do various things with that. But it's very cut and said, awk kind of friendly. There's an API. Um, the whole point of these parameters is that you can create your own parameters in your own components, uh, or if, even if you're working in the core. So there's an API for registering and looking up uh, new MCA parameters. It's relatively easy to use. Um, there's basically functions for registering and re uh, functions for looking up. There's a couple of different variations of each, but they're all described in this header file here. I'm not going to go into detail into it here. There's actually lengthy comments in here that explain what all the different API functions do. Um, typically, components during the beginning of time register all their parameters, right? Now, there's, there's two different hooks. I'm not going to go into the, the huge difference between them now. There's a hook for register and a hook for open. Uh, we've been encouraging everybody to move their registration and creation of MCA parameters to this registration hook, but a lot of people still do it in the open hook. Um, but we would like it to all go here. So all new code should use this register hook to register their MCA parameters. Um, basically, all that umpi info does, that, that command I mentioned on the previous slide, just goes through, finds a bunch of uh, plugins, and then calls register, open and close on, on all of them to find all the parameters, find all the plugins, and things like that. Now, just like symbols in, the, in your components and whatnot, the prefix rule applies here as well. So when you make an MCA parameter, the prefix rule applies. It has to be framework, component, and then name. All right, so for example, BCL, TCP, MTU. This is the MTU that the TCP BTL is going to use, right? Or call basic BCAS crossover. This is the number of processes before the BCAS switches from one algorithm to another in the basic collective uh, component. <coughs> now, as a way of enforcing this prefix rule, 
our registration API actually takes three string names. So it doesn't just take one name that you can supply. It says, no, 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 you have to give me all three. Right? So the framework component and the name and so on. Now, if you're outside of a component and you're in the core, just use the project name and then the component name is base. Right? So Orte base this, Umpi base that, and so on. Okay, that's it on the parameters. I'm going to talk a bit more here about some highlights of common code that if you're going to be developing in our code base, these are a few conventions and a few things that you should know so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Init and finalize. This is something that um, in MPI, which again, our main product today is the MPI API, the very first function you have to call is MPI init, and the very last function you have to call is MPI finalize. So we took those two names to heart and use those everywhere init and finalize. So whenever you have something that needs some startup at the beginning of time or any given scope, and then something that needs to be closed at the end of a scope, call it init and finalize. So for example, umpi MPI init initializes the MPI layer, and Orte init, and Opal init, and so on. And these guys are paired with their corresponding finalize function. So there's umpi MPI finalize, Orte finalize, and, and Opal finalize. And again, the whole point is that the finalize guys free resources and all that kind of good stuff. Now, they're not just used for the overall projects, we also use them for individual subsystems in the projects. So for example, there's a, a subsystem in the umpi layer called op, right? And we have an umpi op init and umpi op finalized. Just like there's a data type subsystem in Opal, we have init and finalized for that as well. So again, it applies to anything, init and finalize, you'll see that nomenclature all over the place. Now, in each of the projects, we have something called utility code, too. So under project, you'll see a util directory in both, in all of Orte, Opal, and Umpi. Um, for example, Opal has a lot of compatibility code for like AS, printf, QSort, base name, stern copy. I think we had one esoteric place in Solaris where QSort is broken. I, I, I don't even remember what the issue was. But, so we have our own implementation of QSort that on Solaris, it'll just act, activate itself. And ASPrintF doesn't exist everywhere, so on those platforms, it'll automatically use our Opal implementation of it. Now, on those platforms that do have it, you know, we don't use it. We'll use the system one, not ours, obviously. But there's a lot of useful add-on code here, and I just cite four of them. So manipulating argv style arrays, so arrays of strings, uh, printf debugging kinds of things, error reporting, and IP interfaces. Let me just briefly go through these. Again, I'm not going to go through the APIs. I'm just going to show them to you. So you can see and say, oh, I don't need to invent that wheel. This is something that exists down in Opal Util. Arrays of strings happens in all over the place, actually. Uh, more often than you would think, that you need an argv style of, of strings. So we just have a, a look at this file here. Um, there is a whole pile of functions out there for uh, prepending and appending, inserting and removing, and it'll resize the array and do the mallocs properly and all these kinds of things splitting and joining them, freeing them, and all of its strings. You don't need to write any of that junk. We've got all that down in the Opal argv area. Go look at those functions yourselves. All right, again, this is boring. <laughs> so why write it yourself? Please use what's already there. Opal output is, uh, Opal output is your friend. Opal output basically is a printf style debugging thing. And it's not a macro, it's an actual function, but it's a var args kind of thing. And it understands all of the printf like arguments, so percent %s, percent %d, and so on. But it does uh, some critical things. Number one, it can multiplex the output to multiple places. So for example, to standard error, standard out, to a file, other places, things like that. And when you're particularly debugging at scale, there are bugs that sometimes only show up when you're running a thousand MPI processes. You just can't spew everything to standard out because that changes the timing and then the bug doesn't show up. But you could potentially spew them all to a thousand different files and see what happens there. Um, so it can go to syslog. It can multiplex to a lot of different places. Um, we have a built-in stream number zero that prepends the host and PID of what it is that you're outputting. And the way it looks is like this. So here's Opal output. The very first argument is this stream number, right? So zero is the default one. But you can create your own that does, you know, multiplexes two files or, or whatever. Um, there's Opal output, which is the basic form. There's Opal output verbose, which will only output if the verbosity level is that or higher. 
So you can selectively output stuff that it determines at runtime. And then the capital versions of them will get compiled out if it's an optimized build. All right, so this is helpful stuff for, oh, I only want developers to see this extra output stuff. Uh, and I don't even want the, the cost of that because this is in the critical performance path. So in an optimized build, I don't want that stuff there. Okay, so Opal output is your friend, particularly when debugging in parallel. Uh, more specifically, you should use a parallel debugger whenever possible, but not all of us can do that because um, they are somewhat expensive even though they're great. Um, but printf debugging, a lot of people do it. Here's a slightly better way of doing printf debugging. Another critical one is user error messages. Um, we like to pride ourselves in being fairly user friendly um, in that, remember that the target audience for MPI are not computer scientists. They're not necessarily even very good programmers. They may actually not program anything at all. They might just be the technician who's running the code. So we like to give a good error message when something goes wrong. However, nobody likes writing 20 printf statements um, and then changing them and reflowing and the text, you have to move the new lines, all this, it's terrible, right? So we have a system called Opal Show Help that does two things. Number one, it reads from text files so you can go put your error message in a text file, including %s, %d for substitution kinds of things. Um, but then you can use a real text editor for writing it and reflow things that way and all that kind of good stuff. But it also deduplicates messages. Key point there being that if they run into an error on one process, they may actually run into it on all a thousand processes. And we don't need to print that error message a thousand times. We actually really only want to print it once and say, you know what, the same exact error message happened 1,023 other times, right? So it deduplicates and it allows you to put text in text files rather than in source code. So here's an example of it. Uh, you call Opal Show Help, you give it a, a file name, a topic name, and then you basically pass the parameters that you want to percent substitute in. And just to drive that home, here's what the text file would look like. Here's the topic name right, inside brackets, and then you have some kind of thing, and you say, oh, here's a percent D and a percent S. All these things get substituted in just like you would expect. And we will actually send this in a separate control channel so that it goes in the standard error stream, uh, and it only goes once. So it's actually a pretty nice thing. Go look at Opal Show Help when you need to show error messages. Another common thing that's actually pretty important is discovering IP interfaces. This is wildly system dependent. Uh, BSD does it completely different than Linux, does it completely different than OS X and Solaris and Windows, everything. This is all actually componentized, so we have plugins for all of this stuff. Although for strange historical reasons, the interface to it here is under util if.h. Um, but basically it gives you an STL-like interface to iterate over, say, oh, here's the first interface, the next interface, the next interface. And every single one of them you could say, oh, Give me the name. Oh, it's ETH0. Oh, it's ETH1, and so on and so on. The flags, it's NetMask, whether it's a loopback interface, all these kinds of things. Now, the next thing that I uh, talk about here in the common code is something that Ralph asked about a little while ago, is the object system. So when we started the OpenMPI project, there was big debates about, are we going to write this in C or in C++? For a lot of reasons, we chose C. Um, Big religious debate, not going to go into that right now. We ended up with C, but we wanted a couple of C++-like things. We wanted a very simple single inheritance thing that have constructors and destructors and also built-in reference counting. So we built a, a series of macros and functions that give us exactly that built on top of, of C. And it works with either the statically or, uh, or dynamically allocated things, meaning on the stack or on the heap. But let me give you a little bit of an example of this because you'll see this all over the place uh, in the code. So what you do is you define a class in header. This is the, the, the deepest technical I'm going to go. You define a class in a header, but the first member of, I'm sorry, when I say class, I mean a struct, right? But it's a class. Um, the first member of it has to be the parent of this. And just like Java, we have a, a root parent called Opal Object T. Um, but it might also be like uh, you're deriving something from a list member so that this guy can be put on a list. You put the parent object as the first thing. And then you use this macro, object class declaration, and you use the same name. Oompy foo t and oompy foo t. 
Okay? And again, this is an open MPI convention that we type def struct blah and put blah at the end just because we're lazy. We don't like typing the word struct, I guess. <laughs> okay? So this is how we declare that. And then we instantiate that somewhere by saying, ah, okay, use this other macro, object class instance, and here's that name again, umpi foo t, and we specify, again, its parent type, and then a function pointer for its constructor and destructor. Okay? Now, the constructor and destructor are not as flexible as they are in C++. They only get one argument. It's basically the this. Right? So you get a pointer to the thing that's being created or destroyed. Um, but yeah, that's generally how it does it. And we will call it for all of them. So we'll call it for you know, the foo construct, and we'll also call the parent constructor if he has one, and then the destructor and so on in the opposite order. Okay. Now, on a dynamically allocated object, we have a new macro, right? So very kind of similar to the C++ new operator. Operator new, I never get those right. Uh, you just call object new with the type. And it'll malloc it out and call all the constructors, and you get a, a pointer back to it. Okay, so it's kind of like the C++ new operator. All right, and then there's, uh, again, I mentioned reference counting. We like reference counting a lot because we have internal handles that we pass around a lot, and we want them to just disappear when they're done. All right, so you can increase the reference count on any given object and decrease the reference count on any object. And when the reference count goes to zero, we will automatically invoke the destructors and free it. Right? He hates that back there. But this is very useful to us internally. <laughs> it is Java-like, yes, and C++-like. But the, the reason for it is that MPI, MPI is really a giant state engine. And we inject things all over the place, and different pieces of the state engine need to say, don't let this go away until this state occurs and it's distributed and they have no global knowledge of each other and so the only way we can do it is with reference counts. Right? So all the different states increase and when they all decrease, when the last guy gets to zero, it's freed properly. Right? So it actually works nicely with all the caveats that you understand how reference counting works properly because you can really shoot yourself in the foot if you, if you do it wrong. All right. Now this also applies, or at least sort of applies, to static objects. So notice this guy's on the stack, he's not on the heap. But I can explicitly call his constructor and all of his parents' constructors and say, oh, I can, you know, this particular instance invoke his constructors and there's his type and that's how it finds it and so on. And then you can explicitly destruct it as well. Now you can use retain and release with it not really meaningful. And actually, if you do release and it goes to zero, I guarantee bad things are going to happen. We don't have error checks for that. All right? So you can use retain and release, but you probably don't want to for static objects. All right? um, and ob also, too, since this is C, not C++, we don't have it automatically call release or destruct when something goes out of scope. All right? So that's a major feature that doesn't exist because of the language, but we didn't really want that anyway. All right, now, the reason I went through that stuff is because we use this object, poor man's object thing, a lot in OpenMPI. So we have lists and free lists and hash tables and value arrays and various other things that all use this reference counting and this object system because we want constructors and destructors and so on. So a lot of this stuff is in uh, the opal tree and the umpi tree, and I think you have a bunch in the orte tree as well, Ralph. Um, you will typically find it in project slash class, anything that uses this object stuff. All right, so umpi slash class, orte slash class, class, and opal slash class. Here's an example of it, opal list. All right, opal list is a doubly linked list. Um, unlike the STL, we transfer the ownership so if you put something on a list, we don't copy it onto the list. We actually take the, the, the list now owns that item. And again, it's an order one operation because this is about optimization here. This is not about convenience. All right, so our, uh, you can go look at this. This is in Opal Util, obviously. <clears throat> um, pointers are never inadvertently, oh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, right, so opal list will never invalidate anything, but it will add and remove things to lists and so on, and it's doubly linked, so you can go in both directions. There's a lot of order one operations because, again, we use lists a lot throughout the code base, and efficiency matters here because we do use these in code performance critical situations. Um, now, when you compile a, a debugger version, right, so a developer version, we automatically add a lot of asserts and other stuff in here, so they're a lot slower when you do a developer build. So this is one of these places where, you know, you run a developer build and you benchmark and you're like, wow, why is it so slow? Because we added a lot of stuff in here and other places. There's a lot of other containers out there too. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, but look at Project Util and Project Class. There's a lot of good stuff there that you do not need to write. I have seen new developers come in and like, oh, yes, I need to write my own linked list. Da -da 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 -da. And they write you know, all kinds of code and they spend a lot of time doing it. And then I'll, they'll show it to me a week later. I'm like, why did you write that? Why didn't you look at, oh, I didn't even know that was there. So I'm telling you, it is there. Go look in the Project Util and Project Class. Now, that being said, if you don't find what you're looking for, you might want to go put it in the util directory so that other people can do that. So Ralph and I actually just wrote, recently wrote something called Opal Hotel, which is useful for retransmission schemes on an unreliable uh, network interface. So when we put that down in the Opal Util directory, so it's the Opal Util Hotel stuff. All right, so consider, you know, if, if you don't find what you're looking for, contribute to the community. Okay, the last bit that I'm going to talk about here today is something called hardware locality. Hardware locality is both a sub-project of the overall OpenMPI umbrella. I don't mean this project in terms of layers, but uh, open source project. It's part of the OpenMPI umbrella of code and repositories, but we also use it in the OpenMPI code base itself. Um, rationale, but before we begin here, when you write high performance computing, modern server architectures are just complicated. Right? And they're getting even more so. Right? So high performance code is all about location, location, location. You need to know where you are. NUMA is now, it's not just common, it's pervasive. Everything is NUMA these days. Right? Um, and you can consider that, that the network is really the next level of locality or the next several levels of locality. So I like to use the term NUNA, the non-uniform network architecture, because you can think internal of a box so if you're using you know, hypertransport or QPI or whatever you are, that's just a network too, right? So if you consider that as the, the first layer network and then uh, your, your leaf switch above that and then your core switch above that and you know, inside all of those are, uh, it gets, it, there's lots of levels of hierarchy here and they're all just different types of networks. So I like the term NUNA. But my point is that performant code must understand locality. So um, the guys over in Enria in France um, wrote this awesome tool called Hardware Locality, and it provides inside the server information about the topology, right? And it offers it in a bunch of different ways. So there's a command line interface that gives you both pretty print and pictures. Here's a sample picture. I'll talk about that in a second. Also outputs it in XML, and it can, there's also a C API that gives you all exactly the same information. Um, this picture over here is from the LS Topo, which is the CLI, the command line version of Hardware Locality. Um, this picture here is one of their machines over there in France. And what it's showing is that it's a two NUMA node machine. So this big green thing here is one NUMA node. And this big green thing over here is, is another NUMA node. And inside that NUMA node, he has just one socket. Here's an L3 cache that is shared between two cores. In the cores, I have two hyper threads each. It also shows PCI devices, which are very handy. This guy here is IB0, so it's an InfiniBand over Ethernet device. Um, this is the hard disk, SDA. This is ETH0 there and so on. And then over on the other side, you see we see the same processor architecture, but no PCI devices over there. So this is a handy, for example. We can see that ETH0 is local to this NUMA node. And that's actually fairly important because modern servers, I might have multiple PCI complexes, and you might want to use the NIC that is close to you, right? So wherever, if you're running here, you want to use that Ethernet interface. But if you have another Ethernet interface, you might want to use that if you're running on that machine over, or that uh, processor over there. All right, this is just a bigger picture. Wish I had done that first, sorry. Here is a, a modern Sandy Bridge server. This is a Cisco server. 
um, that you can see it's a, a much larger processor. Again, two NUMA nodes here. Um, lots of memory on both, 32 gigs on both. Huge, giant L3 shared cache. And you can see all the different L1 and L2 caches. And actually, L1 instruction, L1 data. So it even breaks it out that fine. You can see all of this stuff, which might actually be very, on the sizes, you probably can't see it on the video, but the L1 cache is 32K, and the L2 cache is 256, and the L3 is 20 megs. You can have cache-specific algorithms, which are very important for, uh, for high-performance computing kinds of things. Um, you can make sure that you know, your fetches and whatnot fit inside cache, and your loops and things like that. And then you can see that you know, I have some PCI devices that are local to this node and some PCI devices that are local to that node. Again, very useful types of information. It's all about location, location, location. So what does HWLOG do? Well, number one, it queries all that topology information that we just saw, right? So, um, and there's a C API that gives you all of that information too. So that was the pretty print picture that it exports, but all of that data is available in a C structure as well. It also does memory and process affinity, right? So you can say, oh, this process, I want bound to that core, and so on, um, or that set of cores. There is a uh, command line tool for that called hwloc bind, and I wrote it's much more better than NUMA control. Uh, anybody who's done processor affinity before has probably used NUMA control. hwloc bind is much, much more flexible and much less non-deterministic than NUMA control. I would have, uh, strongly encourage you to go look at, at that. Here's an example of it, actually. So you can see, I'll bind a socket zero and the third core on that socket. You don't have to figure out any of this. What is the ID of the core that I want to bind to that Linux calls it? Because that might be 38. You know? Socket zero, core three might map to Linux 38. Who knows? Let HWLOG figure that out. You just want some natural human kind of representation of that, well, socket, cool, socket zero, core three, right? And then run my application. There's also a C API for that, you know, set my CPU bind, all these kinds of things. Also works on lots of different OSs, right? So we're used to thinking mainly about Linux, but there's a lot of other OSs out there. So Windows, OS 10, BSDs, and, and so on. Now, it is subject to the limitations of that operating system. For example, on OS 10, this function will return failure because OS 10 does not support processor binding, right? But basically, it is a generic interface that works on all of these operating systems, and it's pretty nice. Now, as a sub-project, it is hosted on openmpi.org, has its own subversion repository. It's developed mainly by Enria France, but a full copy of it is maintained in the OpenMPI code base as well because we use it, right? Now, um, that being said, it's also fully documented, and it's a great little standalone tool, because really, it has nothing to do with MPI, right? This is just great little standalone functionality, um, and I highly encourage you to check it out. But let me talk a little bit more about our use of it in OpenMPI, because we maintain a full copy of it. We, and when I say we maintain a full copy of it, we embed it. It's actually in the OpenMPI code base. We have a full copy of it in there. Um, you can use an external HWLOC with OpenMPI, but we validate that you know, this version works properly with OpenMPI. Um, that's why we embed it. Now, we use it to discover server topology, right? So for all the reasons that I was just talking about, OpenMPI uses all that information for those kinds of things. We query the cache sizes and the peer locality and uh, the PCI device locality, all these kinds of things. We actually do that in OpenMPI, right? More to the point, we've started doing that. Hopefully by the time you see this video, we're doing a lot more of that. We're really just getting started with the wealth of information that HWLOC uh, can give to that. We anticipate using this a lot more throughout the rest of the code base over time. But there's a bunch of places, you look in the OpenMPI code base, you'll see references to HWLOC functions that are being used. All right, and with that, I am done. Any questions? All made perfect sense for everybody, I'm sure. All right, we'll just skip ahead to the thank you slide then. Thank you very much for your time. Hope this was useful, especially those of you who are watching this after the fact, and hope you got something out of it. Thanks.